Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on in our study of 2 Timothy, Paul's second letter to Timothy. Mm -hmm. We're in, we left off in the third chapter in verse 16, Mm -hmm. but we didn't finish it. So we're going to pick up there once again today. And we are going to do that right at the mark. Ask for God's blessing on our time together today. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all your word. And just show, show us what we need to see to apply it to our hearts and minds, to, sh- to give it to others. Amen. 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 All right, as I said, we were talking about this when we ended in our last session. But Paul says that all scripture is God-breathed, which is what it says in the Greek. Mm-hmm. And profitable for, for, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Uh, profitable for teaching. The King James says doctrine. Mm-hmm. But in, in essence, they're the same thing, doctrine and teaching. teaching. And we're talking about God's, te- God's teaching, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's laying out a plan to be followed. Right. All right? It, you see, in common use, the word doctrine seems to convey either a religious purpose or a stronger truth than teaching. Yet all of God's word is teaching, teaching us to believe, think, speak, and act as we should, Mm -hmm. and not just in religious things, right? Right. Life. That, okay. Pertaining to life. No, pertaining to life and and godliness. godliness. That's what Peter wrote, Mm -hmm. right? In his second letter in the first chapter, he said, uh, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. This knowledge of him mm-hmm. who is the word right. trains us in both the religious things, the mm-hmm. spiritual things, mm-hmm. but also in the life things. It's, mm-hmm. uh, the Bible is not a religion book. It's a life book. Right. Okay. It's the best book on business that's ever been written. Yes. A lot of people don't get that. I mean, for years, we ran a a ministry called the M.D. Solomon Institute, which is basically principles in the workplace, biblical principles in the workplace. It's the best book ever written on biblical, on on workplace practices. This is the employee handbook for the business. It's the employee handbook for everything, right? You know, we spent a, a long time together down in Belize, Central America. And I had an accident, as most of you probably know. But when we went back after the accident, I wound up doing some, I was asked to do some consulting work for the government. And I remember one day I had a meeting and they had given me an office. Um, and I, I guess it was with, I don't remember whether it was the prime minister or the attorney general. And he came in and in my office, I had placed a little, um, Plaque. plaque, so to speak. And I had a scripture on it. And the scripture was from Proverbs 14, 23, which says, in all labor, there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And whoever it was, I believe it was the attorney general came in and he looked at that and he said, that's, that's amazing. What's, where'd you get that? What's that from? So I said, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because, you know, Nike didn't come up with the idea of just do it. No. We talk too much and do too little, too, all too often. So throughout Proverbs and throughout the whole Bible, as a matter of fact, that's why it was called the M.D. Solomon Institute, was most of it started from Solomon's teachings in Proverbs. Mm-hmm. It's the way to live life is there, right? Absolutely. Everything in life is in the Word of God. That's why so many people are having miserable lives, is because they're not living it according to the Word of God. It's training for marriage, yes. training so, for children. <laughs> so it's profitable for teaching, for teaching in all aspects of life. That means if it's not being used to teach when you send your children to government schools, they are not getting good teaching. Absolutely not. Okay? If they're not getting the whole story, they're not getting the truth. A half a truth can be a whole sure. lie. Mm-hmm. Think about that when you send your children off on school buses back to Egypt to be trained in the ways of the world. Okay. The Word of God is profitable for reproof. 
Now, I don't know you, what you think reproof may mean, but are you looking to say something? Oh, I was going to say when somebody's doing something wrong. When somebody's doing you something wrong, them. you yeah. reprove them, yes. See, prophets speak for God, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the word prophet means in Greek, prophetes, to speak for. And yet, think about this, because in Lamentations, one of the, one of the most famous prophets of all time, Jeremiah, had written this. But this is God speaking through him. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. Mm -hmm. But they've seen for you false and misleading oracles. The job of a prophet you know, to expose the iniquities, to reprove people. Mm -hmm. But it's not for judgment or for condemnation. No, it's correction. It's for correction. So to restore you, right? Mm -hmm. That's God's desire, is that we should all be walking in the fullness of life in the Spirit. Now, Jesus, is that not what he means in Matthew 18 when he says, if you see your brother sin, go to him and him alone? Right. And you're, you're reproving him. Mm -hmm. Why? For condemnation? Yeah. Absolutely not. He's in danger. <laughs> but then that means there's a little bit of difference between the next one, which says that it's profitable for correction. Mm -hmm. So reproof has something more. It's dealing with sin. It's dealing with iniquity. It's dealing with error. But correction, what's correction then? You're doing something not the correct way. It's the incorrect way. <laughs> the incorrect way. I mean, if I, I don't know. You used to use the example of the golfer. That's a good example. If you went and paid to have golf lessons, all right? Mm -hmm. So you get a golf pro and he's going to give you lessons. And you're swinging and your swing is not. He's going to be telling you constantly, you know, do this, change it to this, change it to that. That's not condemnation. That's not even, it's not a rebuke. Mm -hmm. That's just correction to bring you closer and closer to a the, better game the better the better game or in this case in the better life all right Amen. so reproof is the larger strokes and corrections is the fine tuning well co correction is it's not so much dealing with sin let's say that okay as it is just right. training you to come this way and this way and this way to, to fine tune your your direction so you're doing it better and better and better okay mm -hmm. Correction is not, that's why it's not like, a, you know, I, I'm trying to think uh, of an example here. I, it's like if, if you're I'm brain dead today. Golfing is good. Okay. You're holding the golf club not the correct way. You're, you right. know, you can still play golf the way you're holding it, but your game isn't going to be as okay. good if you correct your, that's right. the way you're okay. holding it. If you take the golf club and try and bop your instructor over the head with it, <laughs> He's not going to correct you. He's going to reprove you. That's, right. I mean, he's, okay. That's not how you. He, he's going to rebuke you. Okay. For. That's right. Yeah. Because there's something inherently wrong in the attitude, and but you know, what, what he's doing, he's and a good instructor is going to constantly adjust what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So re reproof is more like the hard attitude, and correction is just you're doing something wrong out of ignorance. Well, you know, yes, uh, because you're being trained to do it properly, all right? Um, do you need correction? Sure. Yes. We all need correction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you have to understand something. A, a lot of people take offense when they get corrected. But the point of the matter is you, if you understand that you are not yet perfect, okay, that God is in the process of perfecting you, God is in the process of equipping you, then you should expect to be challenged. You should expect to have somebody telling you, okay, this is a better way to do it. This is the right way to do it, okay? Okay. It's profitable, and this is really important. The Word of God is profitable for training in righteousness. Yes. Now, are you righteous? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Your sins are washed away, and you have now you have a right relationship with the Father. You've been restored to a right relationship with the Father. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are righteous. So why do you need to be trained in righteousness? Because you know I always use the example of Lazarus coming out of the tomb, right? Mm -hmm. Lazarus, Jesus called him out of the tomb. 
He came out. He's a new creation. He's alive. He was once dead, but now he's alive. But the fact is that what's happening is he's still wrapped in the grave clothes of death. So he comes out of that tomb with the old ways of thinking, the old, the old habits. So Jesus, the first thing he says is unbind him. Well, Paul goes on. I mean, what Paul says is do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. So if, you've got to, if you have to now, even in your new life, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind means the changing of our mind. Mm -hmm. When you're changing your mind, that means you're replacing something not right with something that is right or something that's increasing in knowledge of truth, right? Righteousness is defined as faith and love, correct? Well, no, righteousness is first of all defined as being right with God the yeah, Father. Right mm -hmm. relationship. Okay. Right. Being, being right with God the Father. You put on yes. the crisp plate of righteousness. What, what, it results mm -hmm. in, in righteousness and love. I mean, that's yeah. okay. Both of those have to be at play. Mm -hmm. okay. Before Jesus sent out his, his disciples and apostles, right? In the very beginning of his ministry, what did he do? He called them together. On the, on the mount and preach the Sermon on the Mount. What's the Sermon on the Mount? It's training. It's training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. To live right. To live right. Okay, they are right, but now you have to know how to live right. Mm -hmm. You know how to have to learn how to act right, behave right, okay? Jesus did that because he's fulfilling what's in the next part of this verse in 17. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You've got to be equipped... You know, when you were born, I'm trying to put this as nice as possible. You were born stupid. Yeah. You didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> how much did you know when you were born? You knew how to drink. You knew how to cry. You knew how to cry. Yeah, you knew how to cry. You knew how to try and get what you wanted. But the, the fact is, that's like when we're new believers, we have to be trained in how to live this new life. Mm -hmm. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away, but you've got to be trained, and that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. I mean, have you read the Sermon on the Mount lately? This is what how we are supposed to, you know, I talk about people call it the Beatitudes. I say, no, it's the attitudes and behavior. Right. Okay, this is training in the attitudes that we're supposed to have and the behavior that's supposed to be resulting in from that. Now, the King James says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God is not like the Pharaoh of Egypt. And I mean, this is where the people of God start as a, as a people, not as a, more than a, as a family, right? Mm -hmm. And when they were in bondage in Egypt, he was demanding that they do work as slaves, making bricks, right? But would not equip them with what they needed to do it. They had to get their own straw, right? right? Well, God, if he calls you to something, he equips you for it. And what he equips you with is, well, first of all, he's given you your spirit, his, mm -hmm. his spirit. The power. Well, it's, a, it's both the power, but it's the spirit of truth. You have truth within you, mm -hmm. okay? Now, you have, to, you have to get to that place where you have what you need to do it. And that's an ongoing thing. You ever hear the Peter principle in business? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, you yes. know what it is? The Peter principle was that people get promoted in jobs. And they get promoted and promoted and promoted until they, until they finally get to a place where they're incompetent. They get promoted in, because if you get promoted and you do the job great, you get promoted again. And you'll keep doing that until you get to a place where you can't do the job. You can't, you're, not, you're not equipped to do it. Okay. So as a business principle, you want to be you want to be learning all the time, but you don't want to you know you want to be at that place where you have been equipped to be right to do good works. That's what the Sermon on the Mount's about. To, is it not? You're being equipped. Like I said, like I said before, it's like you you believe with your heart, mm -hmm. you confess with your mouth, and that has to result in action. Right. Okay. You can talk about having faith, but like James says, if you say you have faith. But it doesn't result in visible works, and it's not affecting the, affecting the actions of your life. 
you're lying to yourself, all right? When I walk the talk. Yeah, well, so the, re, the result is supposed to be, and this is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Because this is not about us becoming better and better and more visibly better. This is about God becoming more and more visible in us and more and visible, more and more visible through us. That's the reason for all the training. That's the reason for all, all of the things that God is doing in our life, to make us faithful witnesses of his love and power. And so now we go over to the fourth chapter. It starts by saying, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So now this is, remember, this is a personal letter from Paul to Timothy. Mm -hmm. I say that, but remember, it's also, he, well, he's instructing Timothy so that in, Timothy can therefore go on and instruct others, mm -hmm. right? The word is supposed to be viral. It goes on and on and on, all right? Um, the, while the King James doesn't say solemnly charge, the Greek word that's used there very definitely implies that, right? This is serious stuff, in other words. Mm -hmm. he, he's being very serious. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. This is heavy-duty stuff. This is heavy-duty stuff. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Because he'll say in a few verses later, fulfill your ministry. You've got to know what your ministry is, and you've got to do it. You've got to fulfill it. He's just got through telling him what the word is all about. It's profitable, right? right? It's God breathed. It brings life. Mm -hmm. And it's profitable for all this. Now he says, okay, now go preach it. God has given you something. You have to use it and use it to serve him. Exhort with great patience and instruction. People don't receive the word easily. It's not our human nature to accept correction. It's our spirit that desires correction. Because our spirit has a desire to be closer and closer to the Lord, to be more and more like the Lord. So if you're not, if you're doing things and it's not like the Lord, it should be your great desire to have that changed in your life, right? Absolutely. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He's talking about the church. Now, don't lose sight of the fact. I mean, you know, we've done this over a week. So don't lose sight of the fact that in this third chapter, it's been talking about the signs that we will see, the characteristics of the perilous last days. Mm -hmm. And throughout that, it shows all of the failings of mankind inside and outside the church. But it's particularly de dealing within the church. Lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, all these things, all right? Those are the failings. So now he's telling him, for the time will come, he's talking about, okay, I'm telling you about the last days. These last days are going to come, and men will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths, fables, the King James says. That's what the end days are going to look like. Now, I'll tell you, Paul, Jesus, talked about a great apostasy in the, in the last days. Falling away. A great yes. falling away, right? Because they don't want sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. The church wants to have their ears tickled. They want to, have, they want to hear pleasing messages. They want, to have, they want to hear their own desires preached. There are a lot of, I'm telling you, it's incredible how many false prophets, false teachers are out there in the church today. But one of the reasons they're out there is because it's yeah, what people want. Okay? It's a symbiotic relation. It's a very evil symbiotic relationship that feeds on one another. You know, years ago, I was teaching at a, at a, at a small church up in upstate New York. And uh, this, this group had come out of a, another church, and they were telling me about how, how bad it was because the teaching had been so bad, and they were there for so long. I said, why were you there for so long? They, they said, what should we have done? I said, you should repent. Mm. 
That didn't go well. It did, no, it didn't go well. <laughs> and so why should we repent? Because you enabled it. That's right. You know, you, you stayed. stayed there. You you enabled it. You, them, you, you were an audience for them. You, you supported them. You provided an audience. You provided, you were a willing audience listening to what they were saying. You say, you didn't like it, then why were you there? Right. Why didn't you deal with it? Because I'm going to tell you why. It takes it takes very oh, lot of courage to deal with it. To and, confront effort. it. and effort. Yeah, absolutely effort. Confrontation. People don't like it. But when you listen to false teachers, you are enabling, you are you are creating a situation where they can exist. Mm -hmm. If everybody stopped listening to them, they wouldn't be there. They have to have an audience. That's right. Now they're always going to have an audience because there are so many people out there that want the things of the it's flesh. The majority, the wide road people. The wide road people, yes. So if you if you're looking for people to teach what you want to hear, rather than what God wants to say, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. You'll turn their ears from the truth. You, you know you can't coexist. You can't hear the truth and listen to lies because they're in, they're in conflict. I mean, it's interesting how they put it as turn your ears away from the truth. That means you're turning away, and you know you're on your you're walking away. I mean, that's the apostasy, that falling away. That is that is apostasy. Yes, absolutely. So, if you're listening to somebody who's teaching lies, and you're not in a position to be able to confront them and deal with it, stop listening. Stop listening, mm -hmm. because just the very fact that you're listening, whether they know you're there, whether you you're enabling it. Okay, stand for the truth. If you if you are walking in the truth, stand for the truth. All right. But when you turn from the truth, you will turn aside to myths. Right. You'll turn aside to fables. Right. Gonna, you have to have something. There has to be something. Right. No man can serve two masters, but everybody's going to serve somebody. Right. If you turn away from the truth, you're accepting a lie, and those it's are only, myths and yeah, fables. The only two things: the truth and the and the lies. And I will tell you that the church at large. <clears throat> I'm not talking about the remnant. I'm not talking about the true, the bond servants. I'm not talking about the true church. But the church at large today spends more time on myth and fables mm -hmm. than they do on the truth. Thus the large audiences. Thus the large audiences. Why? Because it's pleasant. Yes. It's not challenging them. I don't know when this is going to, exactly when this is going to go up. Mm. But it's close enough for me to say it. There is no Santa Claus. That's right. That's a myth. It's a myth. And so many, in the Second Vatican Council in the mid-60s, the Catholic Church eliminated a great, great, great number of the saints of the church mm -hmm. because they were all, they were all mythological. Mm -hmm. They were, typically what they were, they were pagan gods mm -hmm. who had been brought into, anointed and brought into the church into. to please the people, all right? Rather than make them confront the the lie, I mean, make a choice. You, everything is about choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. Everything is about choice. Yes. This whole thing wraps up, by the way, in the valley of decision. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to understand. You need to make hard choices, and those are hard choices. Mm -hmm. This is a season. I'm not going to get into the whole thing about Christmas, but the simple fact of the matter is, most of what is celebrated as Christmas. In, by Christians, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is all myth. Yes, right. It, it, it doesn't have, it's not the word of God and it's not profitable. I, I will tell you this, and I've said this before, we're talking about scripture. We have in the New Testament, basically 90 years of history in the New Testament, mm -hmm. okay, starting from roughly the birth of Christ to the island of Patmos when John was there and was given the, the letters to the church's revelation and the revelation of, of there. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is no place in that 90 years where the church celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But the word of God says that we are to proclaim his death until he comes. So this becomes one of these substitution things. Yes. If, you do, if you don't accept the lie, you've got to go to the truth. If you accept the truth that it's all about the, the proclamation of his death, then all of a sudden the birth, it's not that it's inconsequential. No, no. 
But, but it has its proper place. Yeah, and its proper place means that God didn't think very highly, didn't think that it was very important in the scheme of things. Okay, I can tell you when the crucifixion took place. Mm -hmm. Because God made sure that it took place at one of the, the holiest days in the mm -hmm. Jewish calendar, which is a Passover. Mm -hmm. That is, God wanted us to celebrate the Passover, and it was the celebration of our eternal life, our acceptance mm -hmm. into eternal life by Jesus' death. Because Christ, as it says, is, is Passover. our Passover. Yes. Okay. I can tell you when the birth of Christ took place, because it says it in Galatians chapter 4, I believe it is. In the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. That's how much God narrows it down. And yet so much energy, dollars, so much everything will be spent on the celebration of Christmas. When it's unimportant. It's a, it's a myth. And it, and it helps people to believe in lies. It's a myth. It is fables. Mm. We're supposed to rejoice in the truth. We're supposed to love the truth. Okay. So you got to decide if you're going to be listening to myths and fables or you're going to be seeking the truth. Remember, Jesus Christ is the truth. So he goes on to say in the next verse, he said to Timothy, well, let me, let me finish that. Well, okay. All right. Go back. Oh. Mm. Be ready in season and out, he'd say. Right? Oh, yes. you got to be ready to deal with God and the things of God all the time. Okay, it's you, you, it's not like when it's comfortable for you, when it's for you. You're already in season and out. We have to, we're supposed to be a people of rejoicing. Re, you rejoice when things are going good. Hallelujah. You rejoice when things are going bad. Hallelujah. <laughs> you give thanks when things are going great. Hallelujah. You give thanks when things are going rotten. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, because that's the word of God. This is what the word of God, that's the doctrine of the word. That's the teaching of the word. Okay, we rejoice in our, we exult in our tribulations. We give thanks in all of this. We give thanks in all things. And, and for all things. All, for all things. Okay, that's in season and out of season. Yes, it is. And we need to be ready to do that. That's what shows for us, that's what I talked about, the behaviors, the attitude and behavior of a Christian. We are to be a people of thanksgiving. For what? Because that shows forth the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Because we know that God is in control. He's in control and he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? Absolutely. Well, if you believe it, then act like it. Okay? Mm -hmm. When things go wrong, give thanks. When things give, go right, give thanks. We are to be that people of thanksgiving. A people of thanksgiving. In season and, and out. Season. Okay. Not just when you feel like it. No. Please don't be led by your feelings. No. Father, I just thank you that we don't have to be led by our feelings because you have not only sent us the spirit of truth, but he is there to guide us in all that we do because those who are being led by your spirit, they are the children of God. So, Father, no matter what's going on in our lives, we thank you. We praise you because you are worthy of our praise. We just bless your holy name, Lord God. And I, above all, I thank you, Lord, that you can use us for the glory of your name. Help us to walk in truth. Help us to walk in your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen and amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Lord. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Oh uh...